The Ensouled Violin by Madame Blavatsky In the year 1828, an old German, a music teacher, came to Paris with his pupil, and settled unostentatiously in one of the quiet faubourgs of the metropolis. The first rejoiced in the name of Samuel Klaus, the second answered to the more poetical appellation of Franz Stenio. The younger man was a violinist, gifted, as rumour went, with extraordinary, almost miraculous talent. Yet, as he was poor, and had not hitherto made a name for himself in Europe, he remained for several years in the capital of France, the heart and pulse of capricious continental fashion, unknown and unappreciated. France was Styrian by birth, and, at the time of the event to be presently described, he was a young man, considerably under thirty, a philosopher and a dreamer by nature. Imbued with all the mystic oddities of true genius, he reminded one of some of the heroes in Hoffmann's Conte Fantastique. His earlier existence had been a very unusual, in fact quite an eccentric one, and its history must be briefly told, for the better understanding of the present story. Born of the very pious country people, in a quiet burg among the Styrian Alps, nursed by the native gnomes who watched over his cradle, growing up in the weird atmosphere of the ghouls and vampires who play such a prominent part in the household of every Styrian and Slavonian in southern Austria, educated later as a student in the shadow of the old Rhenish castles of Germany, Franz from his childhood had passed through every emotional stage on the plane of the so-called supernatural. He had also studied at one time the occult arts with an enthusiastic disciple of Paracelsus and Klunrath. Alchemy had few theoretical secrets from him, and he had dabbled in ceremonial magic and sorcery with some Hungarian Ziganis. Yet he loved, above all else, music, and above music, his violin. At the age of twenty-two, he suddenly gave up his practical studies in the occult, and from that day, though as devoted as ever in thought to the beautiful Grecian gods, he surrendered himself entirely to his art. Of his classical studies he had retained only that which related to the muses, Euterpe especially, at whose altar he worshipped, and Orpheus, whose magic lyre he tried to emulate with his violin. Except his dreamy belief in nymphs and the sirens, on account probably of the doubled relationship of the latter to the muses through Calliope and Orpheus, he was interested but little in matters of the sublunary world. All his aspirations mounted like incense with the wave of the heavenly harmony that he drew from his instrument to a higher and nobler sphere. He dreamed awake, and lived a real though an enchanted life only during those hours when his magic bow carried him along the wave of sound to the pagan Olympus, to the feet of Euterpe. A strange child he had ever been in his own home, where tales of magic and witchcraft grow out of every inch of the soil. A still stranger boy he had become, until finally he had blossomed into manhood without one single characteristic of youth. Never had a fair face attracted his attention. Not for one moment had his thoughts turned from his solitary studies to a life beyond that of a mystic bohemian. Content with his own company, he had thus passed the best years of his youth and manhood with his violin for his chief idol, and with the gods and goddesses of old Greece for his audience, in perfect ignorance of practical life. His whole existence had been one long day of dreams, of melody and sunlight, and he had never felt any other aspirations. How useless! But, oh, how glorious those dreams! How vivid! And why should he desire any better fate? Was he not all that he wanted to be, transformed in a second of thought into one or another hero, from Orpheus, who held all nature breathless, to the urchin who piped away under the plane tree, to the naiads of Calairo's crystal fountain? Did not the swift-footed nymphs frolic at his beck and call, to the sound of the magic flute of the Arcadian shepherd, who was himself. Behold the goddess of love and beauty, herself descending from on high, attracted by the sweet-voiced notes of his violin, 
yet there came a time when he preferred Syrinx to Aphrodite, not as a fair nymph pursued by Pan, but after her transformation by the merciful gods into the reed out of which the frustrated god of the shepherds had made his magic pipe. For also with time ambition grows and is rarely satisfied. When he tried to emulate on his violin the enchanting sounds that resounded in his mind, the whole of Parnassus kept silent under the spell, or joined in heavenly chorus. But the audience he finally craved was composed of more than gods sung by Hesiod, verily of the most appreciative melomanes of European capitals. He felt jealous of the magic pipe, and would fain have had it at his command. Oh, that I could allure a nymph into my beloved violin, he often cried, after awakening from one of his daydreams. Oh, that I could only span in spirit flight the abyss of time. Oh, that I could find myself for one short day a partaker of the secret arts of the gods, a god myself in the sight and hearing of enraptured humanity, and having learned the mystery of the lyre of Orpheus, or secured within my violin a siren, thereby benefit mortals to my own glory. Thus having for long years dreamed in the company of the gods of his fancy, he now took to dreaming of the transitory glories of fame upon this earth. But at this time he was suddenly called home by his widowed mother from one of the German universities where he had lived for the last year or two. This was an event which brought his plans to an end, at least so far as the immediate future was concerned, for he had hitherto drawn upon her alone for his meagre pittance, and his means were not sufficient for an independent life outside his native place. His return had a very unexpected result. His mother, whose only love he was on earth, died soon after she had welcomed her Benjamin back, and the good wives of the burg exercised their swift tongues for many a month as to the real causes of that death. Frau Stenio, before Franz's return, was a healthy, buxom, middle-aged body, strong and hearty. She was a pious and a God-fearing soul, too who had never failed in saying her prayers, nor had missed an early mass for years during his absence. On the first Sunday after her son had settled at home, a day that she had been longing for, and had anticipated for months in joyous visions, in which she saw him kneeling by her side in the little church on the hill, she called him from the foot of the stairs. The hour had come when her pious dream was to be realized, and she was waiting for him, carefully wiping the dust from the prayer-book he had used in his boyhood. But instead of Franz, it was his violin that responded to her call, mixing its sonorous voice with the rather cracked tones of the peal of the merry Sunday bells. The fond mother was somewhat shocked at hearing the prayer-inspiring sounds drowned by the weird, fantastic notes of the dance of the witches. They seemed to her so unearthly and mocking but she almost fainted upon hearing the definite refusal of her well-beloved son to go to church. He never went to church, he coolly remarked. It was loss of time. Besides which, the loud peals of the old church organ jarred on his nerves. Nothing should induce him to submit to the torture of listening to that cracked organ. He was firm, and nothing could move him. To her supplications and remonstrances, he put an end by offering to play for her, a hymn to the sun he had just composed. From that memorable Sunday morning, Frau Stenio lost her usual serenity of mind. She hastened to lay her sorrows and seek for consolation at the foot of the confessional, but that which she heard in response from the stern priest filled her gentle and unsophisticated soul with dismay and almost with despair. A feeling of fear, a sense of profound terror, which soon became a chronic state with her, pursued her from that moment. Her nights became disturbed and sleepless. Her days passed in prayer and lamentations. In her maternal anxiety for the salvation of her beloved son's soul, and for his post-mortem welfare, she made a series of rash vows. Finding that neither the Latin petition to the Mother of God written for her by her spiritual adviser, nor yet the humble supplications in German, addressed by herself to every saint she had reason to believe was residing in paradise, worked the desired effect. She took to pilgrimages to distant shrines. During one of these journeys to a holy chapel situated high up in the mountains, she caught cold amidst the glaciers of the Tyro, 
and redescended only to take to a sick bed, from which she arose no more. Frau Stenio's vow had led her, in one sense, to the desired result. The poor woman was now given an opportunity of seeking out in propria persona the saints she had believed in so well, and of pleading face to face for the recreant son, who refused adherence to them and to the church, scoffed at monk and confessional, and held the organ in such horror. Franz sincerely lamented his mother's death. Unaware of being the indirect cause of it, he felt no remorse, but selling the modest household goods and chattels, light in purse and heart, he resolved to travel on foot for a year or two before settling down to any definite profession. A hazy desire to see the great cities of Europe and to try his luck in France lurked at the bottom of his travelling project, but his bohemian habits of life were too strong to be abruptly abandoned. He placed a small capital with a banker for a rainy day and started on his pedestrian journey via Germany and Austria. His violin paid for his board and lodging in the inns and farms on his way, and he passed his days in the green fields and in the solemn silent woods, face to face with nature, dreaming all the time as usual, with his eyes open. During the three months of his pleasant travels to and fro, he never descended for one moment from Parnassus, but as an alchemist transmutes lead into gold, so he transformed everything on his way into a song of Hesiod or Anacreon. Every evening, while fiddling for his supper and bed, whether on a green lawn or in the hall of a rustic inn, his fancy changed the whole scene for him. Village swains and maidens became transfigured into Arcadian shepherds and nymphs. The sand-covered floor was now a green sward. The uncouth couple spinning round in a measured waltz with the wild grace of tamed bears became priests and priestesses of Tepsichore. The bulky, cherry-cheeked and blue-eyed daughters of rural Germany were the Hesperides, circling around the trees laden with the golden apples. Nor did the melodious strains of the Arcadian demigods, piping on their syrinxes, and audible but to his own enchanted ear, vanish with the dawn. For no sooner was the curtain of sleep raised from his eyes, that he would sally forth into a new magic realm of daydreams. On his way to some dark and solemn pine forest, he played incessantly to himself and to everything else. He fiddled to the green hill, and forthwith the mountain and the moss-covered rocks moved forward to hear him the better, as they had done at the sound of the Orphean lyre. He fiddled to the merry-voiced brook, to the hurrying river, and both slackened their speed and stopped their waves, and, becoming silent, seemed to listen to him in an entranced rapture. Even the long-legged stork, who stood meditatively on one leg on the thatched top of the rustic mill, gravely resolving unto himself the problem of his too long existence, sent out after him a long and strident cry, screeching, Art thou Orpheus himself, O Stenio? It was a period of full bliss, of a daily and almost hourly exaltation. The last words of his dying mother, whispering to him of the horrors of eternal condemnation, had left him unaffected, and the only vision her warning evoked in him was that of Pluto. By a ready association of ideas, he saw the lord of the dark nether kingdom greeting him as he had greeted the husband of Eurydice before him. Charmed with the magic sounds of his violin, the wheel of the Ixion was at a standstill once more, thus affording relief to the wretched seducer of Juno, and giving the lie to those who claim eternity for the duration of the punishment of condemned sinners. He perceived Tantalus forgetting his never-ceasing thirst, and smacking his lips as he drank in the heaven-born melody, the stone of Sisyphus becoming motionless, the Furies themselves smiling on him, and the sovereign of the gloomy regions delighted, and awarding preference to his violin over the lyre of Orpheus. Taken no serieux, mythology thus seemed a decided antidote to fear, in the face of theological threats, especially when strengthened with an insane and passionate love of music, with Franz, Euterpe proved always victorious in every contest, aye, even with hell itself. But there is an end to everything, and very soon Franz had to give up uninterrupted dreaming. He had reached the university town, where dwelt his old violin teacher, Samuel Klaus. When this antiquated musician found that his beloved and favorite pupil, Franz, had been left poor in purse and still poorer in earthly affections, 
He felt his strong attachment to the boy awaken with tenfold force. He took Franz to his heart, and forthwith adopted him as his son. The old teacher reminded people of one of those grotesque figures which look as if they had just stepped out of some medieval panel, and yet Klaus, with his fantastic allures of a night goblin, had the most loving heart, as tender as that of a woman, and the self-sacrificing nature of an old Christian martyr. When Franz had briefly narrated to him the history of his last few years, the professor took him by the hand, and leading him into his study simply said, Stop with me, and put an end to your bohemian life. Make yourself famous. I am old and childless, and will be your father. Let us live together, and forget all save fame. And forthwith he offered to proceed with Franz to Paris, via several large German cities, where they would stop to give concerts. In a few days, Klaus succeeded in making Franz forget his vagrant life and its artistic independence, and reawakened in his pupil his now dormant ambition and desire for worldly fame. Hitherto, since his mother's death, he had been content to receive applause only from the gods and goddesses who inhabited his vivid fancy. Now he began to crave once more for the admiration of mortals. Under the clever and careful training of old Klaus, his remarkable talent gained in strength and powerful charm with every day, and his reputation grew and expanded with every city and town wherein he made himself heard. His ambition was being rapidly idealized. The presiding genie of various musical centers to whose patronage his talent was submitted soon proclaimed him the one violinist of the day, and the public declared loudly that he stood unrivaled by any one whom they had ever heard. These laudations very soon made both master and pupil completely lose their heads. But Paris was less ready with such appreciation. Paris makes reputations for itself, and will take none on faith. They had been living in it for almost three years, and were still climbing with difficulty the artist's calvary, when an event occurred which put an end even to their most modest expectations. The first arrival of Niccolo Paganini was suddenly heralded, and threw Lutetia into a convulsion of expectation. The unparalleled artist arrived, and all Paris fell at once at his feet. 2. Now it is a well-known fact that a superstition born in the dark days of medieval superstition, and surviving almost to the middle of the present century, attributed all such abnormal, out-of-the-way talent as that of Paganini to supernatural agency. Every great and marvellous artist had been accused in his day of dealings with the devil. A few instances will suffice to refresh the reader's memory. Tartini, the great composer and violinist of the seventeenth century, was denounced as one who got his best inspirations from the evil one, with whom he was, it was said, in regular league. The accusation was, of course, due to the almost magical impression he produced upon his audiences. His inspired performance on the violin secured for him in his native country the title of Master of Nations, the Sonate du Diable, also called Tartini's Dream, as every one who had heard it will be ready to testify, is the most weird melody ever heard or invented. Hence the marvellous composition has become the source of endless legends, nor were they entirely baseless, since it was he himself who was shown to have originated them. Tartini confessed to have written it on awakening from a dream, in which he had heard his sonata performed by Satan for his benefit, and in consequence of a bargain made with his infernal majesty. Several famous singers, even whose exceptional voices struck the hearers with superstitious admiration, have not escaped a like accusation. Pasta's splendid voice was attributed in her day to the fact that three months before her birth, the diva's mother was carried during a trance to heaven, and there treated to a vocal concert of seraphs. Malibran was indebted for her voice to St. Cecilia, while others said she owed it to a demon who watched over her cradle and sang the baby to sleep. Finally, Paganini, the unrivaled performer, the mean Italian, who, like Dryden's Jubal, striking on the corded shell, forced the throngs that followed him to worship the divine sounds produced, and made people say that, less than a god could not dwell within the hollow of his violin. Paganini left a legend too. 
the almost supernatural art of the greatest violin player that the world has ever known was often speculated upon never understood the effect produced by him on his audience was literally marvelous overpowering the great rossini is said to have wept like a sentimental german maiden on hearing him play for the first time the princess elisa of lucca a sister of the great napoleon in whose service paganini was as director of her private orchestra for a long time was unable to hear him play without fainting in women he produced nervous fits and hysterics at his will stout-hearted men he drove to frenzy he changed cowards into heroes and made the bravest soldiers feel like so many nervous schoolgirls it is to be wondered at then that hundreds of weird tales circulated for long years about and around the mysterious genoese that modern orpheus of europe one of these was especially ghastly it was rumored and was believed by more people than would probably like to confess it that the strings of his violin were made of human intestines according to all the rules and requirements of the black art exaggerated that this idea may seem to some it has nothing impossible in it and it is more than probable that it was this legend that led to the extraordinary events which we are about to narrate human organs are often used by the eastern black magician so called and it is an averred fact that some bengali tantrikas reciters of tantras or invocations to the demon as a reverend writer has described them use human corpses and certain internal and external organs pertaining to them as powerful magical agents for bad purposes however this may be now that the magnetic and mesmeric potencies of hypnotism are recognized as facts by most physicians it may be suggested with less danger than heretofore that the extraordinary effects of paganini's violent playing were not perhaps entirely due to his talent and genius the wonder and awe he so easily excited were as much caused by his external appearance which had something weird and demoniacal in it according to certain of his biographers as by the inexpressible charm of his execution and his remarkable mechanical skill the latter is demonstrated by his perfect imitation of a flageolet and his performance of long and magnificent melodies on the g-string alone in this performance which many an artist has tried to copy without success he remains unrivaled to this day it is owing to this remarkable appearance of his termed by his friends eccentric and by his two nervous victims diabolical that he experienced great difficulties in refuting certain ugly rumors these were credited far more easily in his day than they would be now it was whispered throughout italy and even in his own native town that paganini had murdered his wife and later on a mistress both of whom he had loved passionately and both of whom he had not hesitated to sacrifice to his fiendish ambition he had made himself proficient in magic arts it was asserted and had succeeded thereby in imprisoning the souls of his two victims in his violin his famous cremona it is maintained by the immediate friends of ernest t w hoffman the celebrated author of die elixir de tofel meister martin and other charming and mystical tales that counselor crespo in the violin of cremona was taken from the legend about paganini it is as all who have read it know the history of a celebrated violin into which the voice and the soul of a famous diva a woman whom crespel had loved and killed had passed and to which was added the voice of his beloved daughter antonia nor was this superstition utterly ungrounded nor was hoffman to be blamed for adopting it after he had heard paganini's playing the extraordinary facility with which the artist drew out of his instrument not only the most unearthly sounds but positively human voices justified the suspicion such effects might well have startled an audience and thrown terror into many a nervous heart add to this the impenetrable mystery connected with a certain period of paganini's youth and the most wild tales about him must be found in measure justifiable and even excusable especially among a nation whose ancestors knew the borgias and the medicis of black art fame three in those pre-telegraphic days newspapers were limited and the wings of fame had a heavier flight than they have now franz had hardly heard of paganini and when he did he swore he would rival if not eclipse the genoese magician yes he would either become the most famous of all living violinists or he would break his instrument and put an end to his life at the same time 
old Klaus rejoiced at such a determination. He rubbed his hands in glee, and jumping about on his lame leg like a crippled satyr, he flattered and incensed his pupil, believing himself all the while to be performing a sacred duty to the holy and majestic cause of art. Upon first setting foot in Paris three years before, France had all but failed. Musical critics pronounced him a rising star, but had all agreed that he required a few more years' practice before he could hope to carry his audiences by storm. Therefore, after a desperate study of over two years and uninterrupted preparations, the Styrian artist had finally made himself ready for his first serious appearance in the great opera house, where a public concert before the exacting critics of the old world was to be held. At this critical moment, Paganini's arrival in the European metropolis placed an obstacle in the way of the realization of his hopes, and the old German professor wisely postponed his pupil's debut. At first he had simply smiled at the vile enthusiasm, the laudatory hymns sung about the Genoese violinist, and the almost superstitious awe with which his name was pronounced. But very soon, Paganini's name became a burning iron in the hearts of both the artists and a threatening phantom in the mind of Klaus. A few days more, and they shuddered at the very mention of their great rival, whose success became with every night more unprecedented. The first series of concerts was over but neither Klaus nor Franz had as yet had an opportunity of hearing him and of judging for themselves. So great and so beyond their means was the charge for admission, and so small the hope of getting a free pass from a brother artist justly regarded as the meanest of men in monetary transactions, that they had to wait for a chance, as did so many others. But the day came, when neither master nor pupil could control their impatience any longer, so they pawned their watches, and with the proceeds bought two modest seats. Who can describe the enthusiasm, the triumphs of this famous and at the same time fatal night? The audience was frantic, men wept and women screamed and fainted, while both Klaus and Stenio sat looking paler than two ghosts. At the first touch of Paganini's magic bow, both Franz and Samuel felt as if the icy hand of death had touched them. Carried away by an irresistible enthusiasm, which turned into a violent, unearthly mental torture, they dared neither look into each other's faces, nor exchange one word during the whole performance. At midnight, while the chosen delegates of the musical societies and the Conservatory of Paris unhitched their horses and dragged the carriage of the grand artist home in triumph, the two Germans returned to their modest lodging, and it was a pitiful sight to see them. Mournful and desperate, they placed themselves in their usual seats at the fire corner, and neither for a while opened his mouth. Samuel! at last exclaimed Franz, pale as death itself. Samuel! it remains for us now but to die. Do you hear me? We are worthless. We were too madmen to have ever hoped that anyone in this world would ever rival him. The name of Paganini stuck in his throat as in utter despair he fell into his armchair. The old professor's wrinkles suddenly became purple. His little greenish eyes gleamed phosphorescently, as, bending toward his pupil, he whispered to him in hoarse and broken tones, Nine, nine, thou art wrong, my Franz. I have taught thee, and thou hast learned all of the great art that a simple mortal and a Christian by baptism can learn from another simple mortal. Am I to blame because these accursed Italians, in order to reign unequalled in the domain of art, have recourse to Satan and the diabolical effects of black magic? Franz turned his eyes upon his old master. There was a sinister light burning in those glittering orbs, a light telling plainly that, to secure such a power, he too would not scruple to sell himself body and soul to the evil one. But he said not a word and turning his eyes from his old master's face, he gazed dreamily at the dying embers. The same long-forgotten incoherent dreams, which after seeming such realities to him in his younger days, had been given up entirely, and had gradually faded from his mind, now crowded back into it with the same force and vividness as of old. The grimacing shades of Ixion, Sisyphus, and Tantalus resurrected, and stood before him, saying, what matters hell in which thou believest not? And even if hell there be, it is the hell described by the old Greeks, not that of the modern bigots, 
a locality full of conscious shadows to whom thou canst be a second Orpheus. Franz felt that he was going mad, and, turning instinctively, he looked his old master once more right in the face. Then his bloodshot eye evaded the gaze of Klaus. Whether Samuel understood the terrible state of mind of his pupil, or whether he wanted to draw him out, to make him speak, and thus to divert his thoughts, must remain as hypothetical to the reader as it is to the writer. Whatever may have been in his mind, the German enthusiast went on, speaking with a faint calmness. Franz, my dear boy, I tell you that the art of the accursed Italian is not natural, that it is due neither to study nor to genius. It never was acquired in the usual natural way. You need not stare at me in that wild manner, for what I say is in the mouth of millions of people. Listen to what I now tell you, and try to understand. You have heard the strange tale whispered about the famous Tartini. He died one fine Sabbath night strangled by his familiar demon, who had taught him how to endow his violin with a human voice, by shutting up in it, by means of incantation, the soul of a young virgin. Paganini did more. In order to endow his instrument with the faculty of emitting human sounds, such as sobs, despairing cries, supplications, moans of love and fury, in short, the most heart-rending notes of the human voice, Paganini became the murderer not only of his wife and his mistress, but also of a friend, who was more tenderly attached to him than any other being on this earth. He then made the four chords of his magic violin out of the intestines of his last victim, this is the secret of his enchanting talent, of that overpowering melody, that combination of sounds which you will never be able to master unless... The old man could not finish his sentence. He staggered back before the fiendish look of his pupil, and covered his face with his hands. Franz was breathing heavily, and his eyes had an expression which reminded Klaus of those of a hyena. His pallor was cadaverous. For some time he could not speak, but only gasped for breath. At last he slowly muttered, Are you in earnest? I am, as I hope to help you. And, and do you really believe that had I only the means of obtaining human intestines for strings, I could rival Paganini? asked Franz, after a moment's pause, and casting down his eyes. The old German unveiled his face, and with a strange look of determination upon it, softly answered, Human intestines alone are not sufficient for our purpose. They must have belonged to someone who had loved us well, with an unselfish, holy love. Tartini endowed his violin with the life of a virgin, but that virgin had died of unrequited love for him. The fiendist artist had prepared beforehand a tube, in which he managed to catch her last breath as she expired, pronouncing his beloved name, and then he transferred this breath to his violin. As to Paganini, I have just told you his tale. It was with the consent of his victim, though, that he murdered him to get possession of his intestines. Oh, for the power of the human voice, Samuel went on after a brief pause. What can equal the eloquence, the magic spell of the human voice? Do you think, my poor boy, I would not have taught you this great, this final secret, were it not that it throws one right into the clutches of him who must remain unnamed at night? he added with a sudden return to the superstitions of his youth. Franz did not answer, but with a calmness awful to behold, he left his place, took down his violin from the wall where it was hanging, and with one powerful grasp of the cords he tore them out and flung them into the fire. Samuel suppressed a cry of horror. The cords were hissing upon the coals, where among the blazing logs they wriggled and curled like so many living snakes. By the witches of Thessaly and the dark arts of Circe, he exclaimed with foaming mouth and his eyes burning like coals, by the furies of hell and Pluto himself, I now swear in thy presence, O Samuel, my master, never to touch a violin again until I can string it with four human cords. May I be accursed for ever and ever if I do. He fell senseless on the floor with a deep sob that ended like a funeral wail. Old Samuel lifted him up as he would have lifted a child, and carried him to his bed. Then he sallied forth in search of a physician. 4. For several days after this painful scene, Franz was very ill, ill almost beyond recovery. 
The physician declared him to be suffering from brain fever, and said that the worst was to be feared. For nine long days the patient remained delirious, and Klaus, who was nursing him night and day, with the solicitude of the tenderest mother, was horrified at the work of his own hands. For the first time since their acquaintance began, the old teacher, owing to the wild ravings of his pupil, was able to penetrate into the darkest corners of that weird, superstitious, cold, and at the same time passionate nature, and he trembled at what he discovered. For he saw that which he had failed to perceive before. Franz, as he was in reality, and not as he seemed to superficial observers. Music was the life of the young man, and adulation was the air he breathed, without which that life became a burden. From the chords of his violin alone, Stenio drew his life and being, but the applause of men and even of gods was necessary to its support. He saw unveiled before his eyes a genuine, artistic, earthly soul, with its divine counterpart totally absent, a son of the muses, all fancy and brain poetry, but without a heart. While listening to the ravings of that delirious and unhinged fancy, Klaus felt as if he were, for the first time in his long life, exploring a marvellous and untravelled region, a human nature not of this world, but of some incomplete planet. He saw all this and shuddered. More than once he asked himself whether it would not be doing a kindness to this boy to let him die before he returned to consciousness. But he loved his pupil too well to dwell for long on such an idea. Franz had bewitched his truly artistic nature, and now old Klaus felt as though their two lives were inseparably linked together. That he could thus feel was a revelation to the old man, so he decided to save Franz, even at the expense of his own old and, as he thought, useless life. The seventh day of the illness brought on a most terrible crisis. For twenty-four hours the patient never closed his eyes, nor remained for a moment silent. He raved continuously during the whole time. His visions were peculiar, and he minutely described each. Fantastic, ghastly figures kept slowly swimming out of the penumbra of his small, dark room in regular and uninterrupted procession, and he greeted each by name as he might greet old acquaintances. He referred to himself as Prometheus, bound to the rock by four bands made of human intestines. At the foot of the Caucasian mount, the black waters of the river Styx were running. They had deserted Arcadia, and were now endeavouring to encircle within a sevenfold embrace the rock upon which he was suffering. "'Wouldst thou know the name of the Promethean rock, old man?' he rode into his adopted father's ear. "'Listen, then. Its name is called Samuel Klaus.' "'Yes, yes,' the German murmured disconsolately. It is I who killed him while seeking to console. The news of Paganini's magic arts struck his fancy too vividly. Oh, my boy, my poor boy! Ha, 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 ha! The patient broke into a loud and discordant laugh. I, poor old man, sayest thou? So, so, thou art of poor stuff, anyhow, and wouldst look well only when stretched upon a frying Cremona violin. Klaus shuddered, but said nothing. He only bent over the poor maniac, and with a kiss upon his brow, a caress as tender and as gentle as that of a doting mother, he left the sick room for a few instants to seek relief in his own garret. When he returned, the ravings were following another channel. Franz was singing, trying to imitate the sounds of a violin. Toward the evening of that day the delirium of the sick man became perfectly ghastly. He saw spirits of fire clutching at his violin. Their skeleton hands, from each finger of which grew a flaming claw, beckoned to old Samuel. They approached and surrounded the old master, and were preparing to rip him open. Him, the only man on this earth who loves me with an unselfish holy love, and whose intestines can be of any good at all. He went on whispering, with glaring eyes and demon laugh. By the next morning, however, the fever had disappeared, and by the end of the ninth day Stenio had left his bed, having no recollection of his illness, and no suspicion that he had allowed Klaus to read his inner thought. Nay, had he himself any knowledge that such a horrible idea as the sacrifice of his old master to his ambition had ever entered his mind? Hardly. The only immediate result of his fatal illness was that as, by reason of his vow, his artistic passion could find no issue. Another passion awoke which might avail to feed his ambition and his insatiable fancy. 
he plunged headlong into the study of the occult arts, of alchemy and of magic. In the practice of magic, the young dreamer sought to stifle the voice of his passionate longing for his, as he thought, forever lost violin. Weeks and months passed away, and the conversation about Paganini was never resumed between the master and the pupil. But a profound melancholy had taken possession of France. The two hardly exchanged a word. The violin hung mute, cordless, full of dust in its habitual place. It was as the presence of a soulless corpse between them. The young man had become gloomy and sarcastic, even avoiding the mention of music. Once, as his old professor, after long hesitation, took out his own violin from its dust-covered case and prepared to play, Franz gave a convulsive shudder, but said nothing. At the first notes of the bow, however, he glared like a madman, and rushing out of the house remained for hours wandering in the streets. Then old Samuel, in his turn, threw his instrument down and locked himself up in his room till the following morning. One night as Franz sat, looking particularly pale and gloomy, old Samuel suddenly jumped from his seat, and after hopping about the room in a magpie fashion, approached his pupil, imprinted a fond kiss upon the young man's brow, and squeaked at the top of his shrill voice, "'Is it not time to put an end to all this?' Thereupon, starting from his usual lethargy, Franz echoed as in a dream, "'Yes, it is time to put an end to this.' upon which the two separated and went to bed. On the following morning, when Franz awoke, he was astonished not to see his old teacher in his usual place to greet him. But he had greatly altered during the last few months, and he at first paid no attention to his absence, unusual as it was. He dressed and went into the adjoining room, a little parlour where they had had their meals, and which separated their two bedrooms. The fire had not been lighted since the embers had died out the previous night, and no sign was anywhere visible of the professor's busy hand in his usual housekeeping duties. Greatly puzzled but in no way dismayed, Franz took his usual place at the corner of the now cold fireplace and fell into an aimless reverie. As he stretched himself in his old armchair, raising both his hands to clasp them behind his head in a favorite posture of his, his hand came into contact with something on a shelf at his back. He knocked against a case and brought it violently on the ground. It was old Klaus's violin case that came down to the floor with a sudden crash that the case opened and the violin fell out of it, rolling to the feet of Franz. And then the chords striking against the brass fender emitted a sound, prolonged, sad and mournful as the sigh of an unrestful soul. It seemed to fill the whole room and reverberated in the head and the very heart of the young man. The effect of that broken violin string was magical. Samuel! cried Stenio, with his eyes starting from their sockets, and an unknown terror suddenly taking possession of his whole being. Samuel, what has happened? My good, my dear old master, he called out, hastening to the professor's little room and throwing the door violently open. No one answered. All was silent within. He staggered back, frightened at the sound of his own voice, so changed and hoarse it seemed to him at this moment. No reply came in response to his call. Naught followed but a dead silence, that stillness which in the domain of sounds usually denotes death. In the presence of a corpse, as in the lugubrious stillness of a tomb, such silence acquires a mysterious power which strikes the sensitive soul with a nameless terror. The little room was dark, and Franz hastened to open the shutters. Samuel was lying on his bed, cold, stiff, and lifeless. At the sight of the corpse of him who had loved him so well, and had been to him more than a father, Franz experienced a dreadful revulsion of feeling, a terrible shock. But the ambition of the fanatical artist got the better of the despair of the man, and smothered the feelings of the latter in a few seconds. A note bearing his own name was conspicuously placed upon a table near the corpse. With trembling hand, the violinist tore open the envelope and read the following. My beloved son, Franz, when you read this, I shall have made the greatest sacrifice that your best and only friend and teacher could have accomplished for your fame. He who loved you most is now but an inanimate lump of clay, of your old teacher there now remains but a clod of cold organic matter. 
I need not prompt you as to what you have to do with it. Fear, not stupid prejudices. It is for your future fame that I have made an offering of my body, and you would be guilty of the blackest ingratitude were you now to render useless the sacrifice. When you shall have replaced the cords upon your violin, and these cords a portion of my own self, under your touch it will acquire the power of that accursed sorcerer, all the magic voices of Paganini's instrument. You will find therein my voice, my sighs and groans, my song of welcome, the prayerful sobs of my infinite and sorrowful sympathy, my love for you. And now, my friends, fear nobody. Take your instrument with you, and dog the steps of him who filled our lives with bitterness and despair. Appear in every arena, where hitherto he has reigned without a rival, and bravely throw the gauntlet of defiance in his face. O France, then only wilt thou hear with what a magic power the full notes of unselfish love will issue forth from thy violin. Perchance, with a last caressing touch of its chords, thou wilt remember that they once formed a portion of thine old teacher, who now embraces and blesses thee for the last time. Samuel Two burning tears sparkled in the eyes of Franz, but they dried up instantly. Under the fiery rush of passionate hope and pride, the two orbs of the future magician artist, riveted to the ghastly face of the old man, shone like the eyes of a demon. Our pen refuses to describe that which took place on that day, after the legal inquiry was over. As another note written with the view of satisfying the authorities had been prudently provided by the loving care of the old teacher, the verdict was, suicide from causes unknown. After this the coroner and the police retired, leaving the bereaved heir alone in the death room with the remains of that which had once been a living man. Scarcely a fortnight had elapsed from that day, ere the violin had been dusted, and four new stout strings had been stretched upon it. Franz dared not look at them. He tried to play, but the bow trembled in his hand like a dagger in the grasp of a novice brigand. He then determined not to try again, until the portentous night should arrive, when he should have a chance of rivaling, nay, of surpassing Paganini. The famous violinist had meanwhile left Paris and was giving a series of triumphant concerts at an old Flemish town in Belgium. 5. One night, as Paganini, surrounded by a crowd of admirers, was sitting in the dining-room of the hotel at which he was staying, a visiting card with a few words written on it in pencil was handed to him by a young man with wild staring eyes. Fixing upon the intruder a look which few persons could bear, but receiving back a glance as calm and determined as his own, Paganini slightly bowed, and then dryly said, Sir, it shall be as you desire. Name the night. I am at your service. On the following morning, the whole town was startled by the appearance of bills posted at the corner of every street and bearing the strange notice. On the night of, at the Grand Theatre of, and for the first time, will appear before the public Franz Stenio, a German violinist, arrived purposely to throw down the gauntlet to the world-famous Paganini and to challenge him to a duel upon their violins. He purposes to compete with the great virtuoso in the execution of the most difficult of his compositions. The famous Paganini has accepted the challenge. Franz Tenio will play, in competition with the unrivaled violinist, the celebrated Fantasy Caprice of the latter, known as the Witches. The effect of the notice was magical. Paganini, who amid his greatest triumphs never lost sight of a profitable speculation, doubled the usual price of admission, but still the theatre could not hold the crowds that flocked to secure tickets for that memorable performance. At last the morning of the concert day dawned, and the duel was in everyone's mouth. Franz Tania, who, instead of sleeping, had passed the whole long hours of the preceding midnight in walking up and down his room like an encaged panther, had toward morning fallen on his bed from mere physical exhaustion. Gradually he passed into a death-like and dreamless slumber. At the gloomy winter dawn he awoke, but finding it too early to rise he fell asleep again. And then he had a vivid dream, so vivid indeed, so lifelike, that from its terrible realism he felt sure that it was a vision rather than a dream. He had left his violin on a table by his bedside,
locked in its case, the key of which never left him. Since he had strung it with those terrible cords, he never let it out of his sight for a moment. In accordance with this resolution, he had not touched it since his first trial, and his bow had never but once touched the human strings, for he had since always practiced on another instrument. But now in his sleep he saw himself looking at the locked case. Something in it was attracting his attention, and he found himself incapable of detaching his eyes from it. Suddenly he saw the upper part of the case slowly rising, and within the chink thus produced he perceived two small phosphorescent green eyes, eyes but too familiar to him, fixing themselves on his lovingly, almost beseechingly. Then a thin, shrill voice, as if issuing from these ghastly orbs, the voice and orbs of Samuel Klaus himself, resounded in Stenio's horrified ear, and he heard it say, Franz, my beloved boy, Franz, I cannot, no, I cannot separate myself from them. And they twanged piteously inside the case. Franz stood speechless, horror-bound. He felt his blood actually freezing, and his hair moving and standing erect on his head. It's but a dream, an empty dream, he attempted to formulate in his mind. I have tried my best, Franzchen. I have tried my best to sever myself from these accursed strings without pulling them to pieces, pleaded the same shrill, familiar voice. Wilt thou help me to do so? Another twang still more prolonged and dismal, resounded within the case, now dragged about the table in every direction by some interior power, like some living, wriggling thing, the twangs becoming sharper and more jerky with every new pull. It was not for the first time that Stenio heard these sounds. He had often remarked them before. Indeed, ever since he had used his master's viscera as a footstool for his own ambition, but on every occasion a feeling of creeping horror had prevented him from investigating their cause, and he had tried to assure himself that the sounds were only a hallucination. But now he stood face to face with the terrible fact, whether in dream or in reality he knew not, nor did he care, since the hallucination, if hallucination it were, was far more real and vivid than any reality. He tried to speak, to take a step forward, but, as often happens in nightmares, he could neither utter a word nor move a finger. He felt hopelessly paralyzed. The pulls and jerks became even more desperate with each moment, and at last something inside the case snapped violently. The vision of his Stradivarius, devoid of its magical strings, flashed before his eyes, throwing himself into a cold sweat of mute and unspeakable terror. He made a superhuman effort to rid himself of the incubus that held him spellbound, but at the last supplicating whisper of the invisible presence repeated, Do, oh do, help me to cut myself off. Franz sprang to the case with one bound like an enraged tiger defending its prey, and with one frantic effort breaking the spell. Leave the violin alone, you old fiend from hell, he cried, in hoarse and trembling tones. He violently shut down the self-raising lid, while firmly pressing his left hand on it, he seized with the right a piece of rosin from the table, and drew on the leather-covered top the sign of the six-pointed star, the seal used by King Solomon to bottle up the rebellious jinns inside their prisons. A wail, like the howl of a she-wolf mourning over her dead little ones, came out of the violin case. "'Thou art ungrateful, very ungrateful, my Franz,' sobbed the blubbering spirit voice. But I forgive, for I still love thee well. Yet thou canst not shut me in, boy, behold. And instantly a grayish mist spread over and covered case and table, and rising upward formed itself into an indistinct shape. Then it began growing, and as it grew, Franz felt himself gradually enfolded in cold and damp coils, slimy as those of a huge snake. He gave a terrible cry, and awoke. But strangely enough, not on his bed, but near the table, just as he had dreamed, pressing the violin case desperately with both hands. It was but a dream, after all, he muttered, still terrified, but relieved of the load on his heaving breast. With a tremendous effort he composed himself, and unlocked the case to inspect the violin. He found it covered with dust, 
but otherwise sound and in order, and he suddenly felt himself as cool and as determined as ever. Having dusted the instrument, he carefully rosined the bow, tightened the strings and tuned them. He even went so far as to try upon it the first notes of the witches, first cautiously and timidly, then using his bow boldly and with full force. The sound of that loud, solitary note, defined as the war-trumpet of a conqueror, sweet and majestic as the touch of a seraph on his golden harp, in the fancy of the faithful, thrilled through the very soul of France. It revealed to him a hitherto unsuspected potency in his bow, which ran on in strains that filled the room with the richest swell of melody, unheard by the artist until that night. Commencing in uninterrupted legato tones, his bow sang to him of sun-bright hope and beauty, of moonlit nights, when the soft and balmy stillness endowed every blade of grass, and all things animate and inanimate, with a voice and a song of love. For a few brief moments it was a torrent of melody, the harmony of which, tuned to soft woe, was calculated to make mountains weep, had there been any in the room, and to soothe even the inexorable powers of hell, the presence of which was undeniably felt in this modest hotel room. Suddenly the solemn legato chant, contrary to all laws of harmony, quivered, became arpeggios, and ended in shrill staccatos like the notes of a hyena laugh. The same creeping sensation of terror as he had felt before came over him, and Franz threw the bow away. He had recognized the familiar laugh, and would have no more of it. Dressing, he locked the bedeviled violin securely in its case, and taking it with him to the dining-room, determined to await quietly the hour of trial. 6. The terrible hour of the struggle had come, and Stenio was at his post, calm, resolute, almost smiling. The theatre was crowded to suffocation, and there was not even standing room to be got for any amount of hard cash or favouritism. The singular challenge had reached every quarter to which the post could carry it, and gold flowed freely into Paganini's unfathomable pockets to an extent almost satisfying, even to his insatiate and venal soul. It was arranged that Paganini should begin. When he appeared upon the stage, the thick walls of the theatre shook to their foundations with the applause that greeted him. He began and ended his famous composition, The Witches, amid a storm of cheers. The shouts of public enthusiasm lasted so long that Franz began to think his turn would never come. When at last Paganini, amid the roaring applause of a frantic public, was allowed to retire behind the scenes, his eyes fell upon Stenio, who was tuning his violin, and he felt amazed at the serene calmness, the air of assurance of the unknown German artist. When Franz approached the footlights, he was received with icy coldness. But for all that, he did not feel in the least disconcerted. He looked very pale, but his thin white lips wore a scornful smile as response to this dumb unwelcome. He was sure of his triumph. At the first notes of the prelude of the witches, a thrill of astonishment passed over the audience. It was Paganini's touch, and it was something more. Some, and they were the majority, thought that never in his best moments of inspiration had the Italian artist himself, in executing that diabolical composition of his, exhibited such an extraordinary diabolical power. Under the pressure of the long muscular fingers of Franz, the chords shivered like the palpitating intestines of a disemboweled victim under the vivisector's knife. They moaned melodiously, like a dying child. The large blue eye of the artist, fixed with a satanic expression upon the sounding board, seemed to summon forth Orpheus himself from the infernal regions, rather than the musical notes supposed to be generated in the depths of the violin. Sounds seemed to transform themselves into objective shapes, thickly and precipitately gathering as at the evocation of a mighty magician, and to be whirling around him like a host of fantastic infernal figures dancing the witch's goat dance. In the empty depths of the shadowy background of the stage, behind the artist, a nameless phantasmagoria, produced by the concussion of unearthly vibrations, seemed to form pictures of shameless orgies, of the voluptuous hymens of a real witch's sabbat. A collective hallucination took hold of the public, panting for breath, ghastly, 
and trickling with the icy perspiration of an inexpressible horror they sat spellbound and unable to break the spell of the music by the slightest motion they experienced all the illicit enervating delights of the paradise of muhammad and came into the disordered fancy of an opium-eating mussulman and felt at the same time the abject terror the agony of one who struggles against an attack of delirium tremens many ladies shrieked aloud others fainted and strong men gnashed their teeth in a state of utter helplessness then came the finale thundering uninterrupted applause delayed its beginning expanding the momentary pause to a duration of almost a quarter of an hour the bravos were furious almost hysterical at last after a profound and last bow stenio whose smile was as sardonic as it was triumphant lifted his bow to attack his famous finale his eyes fell upon paganini who calmly seated in the manager's box had been behind none in zealous applause the small and piercing black eyes of the genoese artist were riveted to the stadivarius in the hands of france but otherwise he seemed quite cool and unconcerned his rival's face troubled him for one short instant but he regained his self-possession and lifting once more his bow drew the final note then the public enthusiasm reached its acme and soon knew no bounds the listeners heard and saw indeed the witches voices resounded in the air and beyond all the other voices one voice was heard discordant and unlike to human sounds it seemed of dogs the bark of wolves the howl the doleful screechings of the midnight owl the hiss of snakes the hungry lions roar the sounds of billows beating on the shore the groan of winds among the leafy wood and burst of thunder from the rending cloud twas these all these in one the magic bow was drawing forth its last quivering sounds famous among prodigious musical feats imitating the precipitate flight of the witches before bright dawn of the unholy women saturated with the fumes of their nocturnal saturnalia when a strange thing came to pass on stage without the slightest transition the notes suddenly changed in their aerial flight of ascension and descent their melody was unexpectedly altered in character the sounds became confused scattered disconnected and then it seemed from the sounding board of the violin came out squeaking jarring tones like those of a street punch a screaming at the top of a senile voice art thou satisfied franz my boy have not i gloriously kept my promise eh the spell was broken though still unable to realize the whole situation those who heard the voice and the punchinello like tones were freed as by enchantment from the terrible charm under which they had been held loud roars of laughter mocking exclamations of half anger and half irritation were now heard from every corner of the vast theatre the musicians in the orchestra with faces still blanched from weird emotions were now seen shaking with laughter and the whole audience rose like one man from their seats unable yet to solve the enigma they felt nevertheless too disgusted too disposed to laugh to remain one moment longer in the building but suddenly the sea of moving heads in the stalls and the pit became once more motionless and stood petrified as though struck by lightning what all saw was terrible enough the handsome though wild face of the young artist suddenly aged and his graceful erect figure bent down as though under the weight of years but this was nothing to that which some of the most sensitive clearly perceived Franz Tenier's person was now entirely enveloped in a semi-transparent mist cloud-like creeping with serpentine motion and gradually tightening round the living form as though ready to engulf him and there were those also who discerned in this tall and ominous pillar of smoke a clearly defined figure a form showing the unmistakable outlines of a grotesque and grinning but terribly awful looking old man whose viscera were protruding and the ends of the intestines stretched on the violin within this hazy quivering veil the violinist was then seen driving his bow furiously across the human cords with the contortions of a demoniac as we see them represented on medieval cathedral paintings an indescribable panic swept over the audience 
and breaking now for the last time, through the spell which had again bound them motionless, every living creature in the theatre made one mad rush towards the door. It was like the sudden outburst of a dam, a human torrent, roaring amid a shower of discordant notes, idiotic squeakings, prolonged and whining moans, cacophonous cries of frenzy, above which, like the detonations of pistol shots, was heard the consecutive bursting of the four strings stretched upon the soundboard of that bewitched violin. When the theatre was emptied of the last man of the audience, the terrified manager rushed on the stage in search of the unfortunate performer. He was found dead, and already stiff behind the footlights, twisted up into the most unnatural of postures, with the cat guts wound curiously around his neck, and his violin shattered into a thousand fragments. When it became publicly known that the unfortunate would-be rival of Niccolo Paganini had not left a cent to pay for his funeral or his hotel bill, the Genoese, his proverbial meanness notwithstanding, settled the hotel bill and had poor Stenio buried at his own expense. He claimed, however, in exchange, the fragments of the Stradivarius as a memento of the strange event. End of The Ensouled Violin by Madame Blavatsky